Hello everybody, Candy Jack Cat here once again with another exciting video. And today we're going to be talking about analog horror. But maybe not the kind you're thinking of. Yeah, the uh, the spooky internet videos with the VHS static and all that weird stuff going on. No, we're not talking about that. Today we're talking about shot on video horror films. And I guess just to give a brief history, um, I'm going to say it was like early... 80s somewhere they started making these these are like independent films that were shot on at what at the time would be consumer grade video equipment so basically the like vhs video cameras very simple editing equipment if you were really low budget what you would do is you'd have to like hook two vcrs together and you have like your raw footage on one tape and then a blank tape at another vcr and then you record the raw footage onto the blank tape but you have to kind of like start and stop it to get everything put in order i've actually done this before just to kind of mess around with it and boy is it a humongous pain in the ass actually but yeah in the early 80s i started making a lot of these movies basically just independent horror films shot on consumer grade equipment a lot of them were very cheap you know, not just because, like, the cameras were cheap. Uh, you, you know, very low pro, like, basically glorified homemade movies. I think gradually has consumer-grade equipment moved more into a digital territory. That was kind of like the end of this whole trend, which kind of had a good run throughout the 80s and 90s. Uh, I think the death of mom and pop video stores also affected it a lot. Independently run small business video stores. That, that was kind of like where your audience was if you were going to make one of these shitty movies, basically. Uh, you know, once Blockbuster became sort of like this dominating force, uh, there wasn't really a market for shot on video movies, except for the rare occasion. I know there was like one called Feeders, which was about alien creatures. Basically, that was after Independence Day came out and Blockbuster was like, we need any alien movie we can get so feeders ended up just being right time right place and you know if you compare feeders to independence day it's actually really not at all the same thing at all a huge quality difference can you believe it so i just wanted to highlight a few of these films in this video and kind of talk about my personal experiences with them so even though this was a trend that started in the 80s and went on into the 90s i didn't find out about these things until i'm gonna say 2008. this was around the time that i was uh, still renting physical dvds off netflix and I feel like a, an old grandpa person every time I talk about this. Young people legitimately just give you the doe-eyed stare at this point. Like, what the hell are you talking about? You fucking old person, go away. But yeah, just in case you don't know, when Netflix started, they didn't do streaming yet. They started by mailing you a DVD. So you'd go on the website, add DVDs to your queue. When I was doing it, you'd get three DVDs at a time. So whatever three DVDs were at the top of your queue, they'd ship those out to you, and then when when you mail one back you get another you can sort of organize your queue this is a whole thing i'm getting into we don't need to talk about that back in 2008 i'm browsing the selection on netflix and i find a movie on there that i've never heard of before called wood chipper massacre at the time i was pretty much looking for any weird schlocky garbage crap i could find so wood chipper massacre seemed to fit the bill uh, i rent it shows up in the mail i pop it in the dvd player and am surprised to see that the quality is extremely low. Like, I was expecting it to be like a grainy shot on, like maybe 35 millimeter, maybe even 16 millimeter. I don't know. I didn't really know the difference of the millimeters of film at the time, but that's not fucking important. Yeah, immediately I'm like, oh my God, this was clearly shot on like an old video camera. Oh my God, this is interesting. Like, I wasn't even mad about it because I just... I love it when movies just have this really rough amateur look to them. I don't know what it is, but I'm about it. So I kind of thought, okay, this is going to be like a real gritty, grimy slasher movie. And it's shot on VHS. So that's just going to make it even creepier, really. I mean, you think of like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was like shot on grainy 16 millimeter film. So yeah, this is kind of like the 80s equivalent, you know, because shot on low-tech video, anything that just makes your movie look like it was shot by an actual serial killer. I think that really adds a lot. Yeah, but funny enough, uh, the movie ends up being nothing like what I was expecting. I think a, a better way to describe it is it's less gritty slasher movie and more 
uh, well, it's been described as like the Brady Bunch meets Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I guess that's kind of not wrong. I would compare it probably more to a movie called uh, Little Shop of Horrors. I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of the uh, the musical version. I think that came out in the 80s, but in the 60s, I'm more, I'm more referring to the original black and white 60s version. The original Little Shop of Horrors was a movie that was like, had this like really corny sense of humor. Like it was not taking itself seriously at all. It was meant to be kind of just a joke. Corny sense of humor, not a ton of creepy, gritty, gory stuff. It's uh, And I feel like Woodchipper Massacre has a very similar vibe of like, there is some gruesome stuff, but you know, like if you want like a gritty slasher film, it's not gonna really satisfy your gore tooth or anything. But if you were coming into this thinking it was going to be more of a comedy, then you might be taken back at there's actually a decent amount of gore considering that. So what's the premise of this movie? I, I guess I should get into that. So basically, like, there's these three kids. I just kicked my table. So this dad's going on a business trip, and he's leaving his three kids alone for the weekend. But just kidding. He's not leaving them alone. He's, he's getting them a babysitter. He's getting their Aunt Tess. Aunt Tess, huge bitch. Just, she, she's just one of those people, uh, everything's a sin. Uh, heavy metal music is devil worship. Horror movies turn you into serial killers. Just any form of fun, just sin. Don't do it. So she's basically ruining, ruining the kids' whole weekend. And the funny thing about this to me is, like, she, it seems really over the top. Like, this, this lady is really overacting. The reality is, I actually don't think she is, because I've met... I, I've met people exactly like this. Just irritable, bitchy people, no fun allowed, and this is like dead on how they act. Zero percent exaggerating. So I guess I can talk a little bit about the kids. So uh, first you got um, oldest kid. Don't remember their names because I, I took notes, but I didn't do a good job taking notes, and that's an important thing to remember. But the oldest kid, he's like probably... I guess he's supposed to be like a teenager. It's actually, uh, he's played by the director of the film, John McBride. And I guess that's all I have to say about him. You got uh, Denise. I did write her name down because I wanted to make comment about, she has some of the best facial reactions. Her acting is maybe a little bit over the top. Like she maybe she could have toned down it a little bit. But when she's not talking and she's just giving facial reactions, like there's actually some really funny stuff there. Like there's a part where there's like a conflict going on and it's just like her looking back and forth. Really good, like little goofy reaction. So, you know, good for her. Then I think the uh, the youngest kid was Tom, maybe. Guys, I don't remember their fucking name. He's a nerd kid with giant glasses that was socially acceptable in the 80s. He's kind of important in terms of pushing the plot forward because he orders a like a mail order Rambo hunting knife or some shit. It's like a big deal. And the knife eventually shows up, you know, while they're being watched by the ant. He's all excited. He runs out, grabs a knife. I don't know what he was thinking. Like this ant has been a buzzkill about everything. He should have like snuck the knife into the house anyway without her noticing but instead he rushes it into the house right to the kitchen opens it it's like wow and then the ant's like what the heck is that by golly and he's just like it's my rambo hunting knife like he's just flaunting it like what do you think was gonna happen well it turns out what happens is she's like uh, give that to me i'm gonna throw it out we're getting rid of that uh, and he's just like um no so she ends up grabbing the knife trying to pull it away from him but he's trying to pull it back and uh, this eventually leads to her yanking the knife out of his hands and then she stabs herself she does die from stab wounds which means we now have a murder on our hands this is where things get really juicy here guys so the kids have to have a good long talk about like what are we going to do about this i feel like this 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 does qualify as an accident. They probably would have been fine to just call the police. Um, but no, we're going to chop her up with a chainsaw, put her in the freezer, and then grind her up in the wood chipper. And that is why this is called Wood Chipper Massacre, in, in case you didn't know. It's actually, like, interesting, the whole process. Like, why did they freeze her first? Well, you can't put soft things in the wood chipper because it'll gum up the blade. So they had to freeze the meat, which is why they had to, like, chop her up first so they could fit her in the freezer. And, you know, there's a little bit of gruesome visuals when they're, like, you know, wrapping up her chopped up meat bits. And if you could just, like, let the absurdity sink in, like, they're not, like, acting disturbed or shocked. Maybe a little grossed out, but... It's like there's mainly just like goofy banter going on between them, like Brady Bunch-like dialogue. It's 
ridiculous. And then you get to the part where they're just like taking all these meat chunks after they're for good and frozen and dropping them in the wood chipper. And he like the oldest brother picks up her head like her and he's like he's holding it so that he's clearly staring at the face. And I'm just like that would I mean I was very young when I first watched this movie so you don't think about this stuff but re- recently overthinking it as an adult as you do I'm just like god that would be such a gut-wrenching thing staring at a severed head of a relative, even if they're a huge bitch. Just like, what a horrifying thing. Anyway, in the wood chipper you go. This is a fun watch. Uh, highly recommend. I think you can watch it on Tubi right now. It's also on YouTube. I found a version that changed some of the music in one part, which probably for like a copyright reason, I don't know, but that's kind of like weird to me. Anyway, it's currently on Tubi. You can just watch it there, I guess. Might be a bit slow for some people. Maybe the overacting can be a little obnoxious, but. If Woodchipper Massacre does not fancy your, um, I don't, I don't really know what I was trying to say there. So the next movie. So we're talking about Splatter Farm next. Um, so Splatter Farm is the, the story of two brothers going to visit their aunt. Uh, aunt Lacey lives on a farm and she lives there with a servant named Jeremy who does stuff, I guess. This is really a movie that needs to be seen to be believed, but I'm hard pressed to actually recommend it to anyone because I don't know if that qualifies as some form of hate crime or not. So this, this movie opens just right off the bat. Uh, a body is being butchered in a gruesome, be it very schlocky manner. And then Jeremy, um, you know, who's, who's the killer, basically. He, he hacks up this body and then uses a severed hand to do some things with it. How creative. If you're not on board with this movie after that, then you're not going to get on board at any point in time. You're just going to get progressively further and further away from being on that board, let me tell you. The opening is also pretty wild because this movie, a slasher movie, important thing about slasher films is they need to have a body count. So this one has a body count of eight. Body count of eight. But here's the thing about that. Most of that body count consists of non-characters. And by non-characters, I also mean non-actors. So let's, let's go back to that victim in the beginning. It's just a crudely put together dummy. It's not even a character, just a dummy that's being hacked up. We never see that character before that ax swings down on their face. And then think immediately after after that, Jeremy goes and he's butchering another body. So it's like, okay, it's just two bodies right there, but they're both dummies. I think I wrote down a, a total body count of eight, four non-dummies, and then one of them is just a pony. In normal horror movies, killing a pony would be like the worst part about it. Like, how dare you kill a pony? This movie's just filled with the worst parts though. So, you know. So I talked about jacking off with a severed hand. Then you have Aunt Lacey, who's just really horny. She's just, she's just giving really horny vibes. She's flirting with one of her nephews. So this is this is trash, basically. This whole movie is trash. It's, it's like they just sat down and like, how can we make pure shock value garbage and creepy old lady ants hitting on their nephews? That's, that's, that's definitely in there. Speaking of Aunt Lacey, I love. There's just one part that sticks out to me. I guess the phone lines are down when the uh, the nephews are up there. One of them's asking, you know, like like how often does this happen? And then she responds with about twice a month. About twice a month. Like her line delivery just kills me. It's just hilarious. Clearly, this lady is not a professional actor at all. Uh, this is just. I I think it was the grandmother of one of the kids making. This is, movie was made by 18 year old kids. You know, so. I know 18 is not, they're not kids, but you, fuck off, you know what I mean. I think it was the grandmother of one of the, 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 guy, the guys making the movie. She didn't have to do any of this shit. And the fact that she is in this movie as much as she is, saying as many lines as she is, what a trooper, honestly. So yeah, her acting's not exactly great, but she's in there. She's doing it. Just gonna get a little clap there. Right on. Awesome. You gotta, you gotta love and appreciate relatives that are willing to put up with your bullshit. I know I've definitely had, you know, family members that 
put up with some nonsense from me. Anyway, there's a part where this woodsman gets his head cut off, and then guess what Jeremy does with it? And what a, what a wild scene. So he chops the woodsman's head off, this woodsman being one of the few live actors in this movie. But anyway, the woodsman gets his head cut off, then it shows, like, the neck stump, and he's, like, the woodsman is grabbing at the neck stump, like, just spasming. But there's no blood squirting out, and it just feels like there should be. Like, it just feels off. There needs to be some blood squirting. But then, you know, the head, which looks nothing like the actor, <laughs> hits the ground and then they squirt blood on it so it's like okay blood is squirting but they're not showing it coming out of the neck and that's such an easy effect to do guys I know that uh, this movie was basically made out of necessity it was like spend as little money as possible like I literally think it was like a hundred bucks is what they spent on this I don't know what that would be adjusted for inflation but maybe they just didn't have the blood I don't know I don't know why I'm picking apart a scene that ends with a severed head getting used for things, but here we are. So there's just a series of weird schlocky things going on for a while, not much of a plot, until the brothers find something very disturbing in one of the barns. A rubber boot filled with red syrup. Truly horrifying. So obviously it's supposed to be like a severed foot, I guess, and that kind of sets things in motion of them figuring out that the probably like a serial killer, probably that creepy uh, kid that's doing all the chores around the house, right? Um, and once they start poking their nose in places, I think that kind of leads to, you know, stuff happening a lot quicker. By that I mean them getting killed off, because Jeremy can't have no witnesses. I mean, they were going to get killed, obviously. I, was, I think that was always sort of part of the plan. Uh, if you choose to watch Splatter Farm, you can also find this one on YouTube currently. Um, I think it's like a cut a cut version. It doesn't cut out any of the horrific content. It just sort of cuts some of the pacing to be a little bit better. So it's like a, I think it's like around a 40 minute cut or something. So if you can find that and you want to subject yourself to that, the fuck is wrong with you? All right, I think we're going to need a little bit of a palate cleanser after that. So I got one more movie to talk about. Tim Ritter's Truth or Dare, colon, A Critical Madness. So I found out this one is actually based on a short film that I guess Tim Ritter also did. So that's neat. Pretty decent. You can So you can find the short film on YouTube. We're going to be getting into the feature length version, though. I feel like this might be one of the more popular um, shot on video films. Past few years, I've gone to a, a convention in Lexington, Kentucky called Scarefest, and there's this guy that makes these neat little, like, custom-made figurines of different horror movie characters, and one of the ones that he does is the slasher from this movie. I think it was like 40 bucks, so not, not bad for, like, this custom-made thing, and I can now proudly say I have a shot on video slasher villain on my, uh, toy collection shelf, so, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, flex or anything, but, you know, it's pretty rad. Anyway, so what's this movie about? Basically, Mike Straub is, I guess, he's kind of a successful businessman type. He's got everything in the world, you know, got a nice house, beautiful wife, decent job, whatever. But then it turns out that the wife is cheating on him and then she kicks him out of the house. I don't know. Is that how that works? Because it kind of looks like he's the breadwinner in this situation. So it seems odd that she would kick him out of the house. I don't know. I've never really been in this situation before. But after that, he's just kind of like going for a drive and he's like having these flashbacks. He's sort of like gradually realizing that there was a lot of clues and hints that the wife was cheating on him. And uh, it's kind of, for a very low budget movie, it's pretty artfully done. I don't know. It's kind of neat the way they do it. It's cutting back and forth through the flashbacks and like they'll keep going back to a flashback but show a little bit more detail like he walks in on the wife on the phone and she's just like oh I gotta call you back and he's like who is that oh it's wrong number or whatever and then they'll cut back to that clip but it shows a little bit more of the conversation it's interesting just kind of like showing his gradual realization of what was going on this whole time I do have to mention Tim Ritter also did another movie called Killing Spree, which also deals with some marital issues in that film. UK Tim Ritter, is there an issue? Is there an issue going on? I mean, I know these movies were made decades ago, so I, I guess it's not really relevant anymore. But yeah, they do kind of try to 
maybe humanize it a little bit. It's not just like she's a cheating hoe or something. Like, like there, there's an aspect of like, she's kind of like bored and the husband wasn't letting her work initially. But then in the flashbacks, it's revealed that he was going to let her work because anything that makes her happy, that's all that matters. But I guess it was too late by that point. She had already sort of gotten involved with this other guy. So there's like, it's, it's not one dimensional. They try to make it a little more complex, which is for one of these kind of movies, pretty, pretty darn impressive. So uh, Mike Straub ends up having another kind of flashback you know apart from the uh, the cheating stuff he has a flashback to his childhood and this is kind of an interesting scene it's actually a little spooky maybe just the way it's done it's like him as a kid playing truth or dare with some of the other kids and they're daring him to cut his arm with a razor and he does it to i don't know if this was the, the director's intention but to me this implies maybe mike has an issue with trying to get validation like he wants the other kids to like him so he'll he'll do anything in truth or dare he'll cut his wrist open with a razor and you know you look at his life as an adult and it's like he has a good job hot wife you know all that shit like he's maybe trying to get validation from his peers from society and then when that crumbles it sends him into a state of madness you know once he realizes that he wasn't good enough for his wife he just can't handle it so that's kind of an interpretation i was picking up from this movie I, again i don't know if that was the intention or not but it's certainly interesting anything where a movie gives you something to sort of think about i think that's you know good even for a schlock fest like this. So that ends up leading into him picking up a random woman off the street and they go camping. And once again, they start playing truth or dare. And uh, this lady starts, you know, daring Mike to do all these horrible things, cut his chest open, rip his tongue off, cut his finger off, you know, it gets pretty wild pretty fast. You know, he dares her to rip her eye out and she ends up doing that. It's actually a really creepy scene in my opinion. Like it's actually really well done. This scene is basically what most of the short film consists of, but they do it a lot better in the feature length film, which which is nice to see. But yeah, it's just a really creepy vibe and it's eventually it's revealed that the other woman was never there. He's just hallucinating, which is your first real hint that this guy is not mentally well. And uh, he ends up being found, brought to a hospital. They fix him up and obviously send him to an institution because again, he's not great in the head and then after so many years he is released because i can't remember if it was because they were running out of space or what the deal was but either way he was deemed fit to be released back in society uh issue the last thing that the imaginary woman dared him to do was kill his wife so i guess he's been holding on to that so anyway, he ends up finding his wife and her new boyfriend. And um, in a normal slasher film, this would be like, okay, he's out of the institution. Now he's going to start a killing spree. And granted, he does kill the boyfriend, does not successfully kill the wife, though. She ends up stabbing him first. And he gets sent back to the institution where he stays for probably like another couple years or so. See, it's a little convoluted. Like, normal slasher film, oh, this he's fit to go back into society. Let's release him. And then the killing starts. Or he escapes and then the killing starts not this movie they're like we're gonna do both baby because we gotta stretch this bad boy out to 90 minutes things gotta happen but anyway while he's in the institution again there is another really weird scene where he's playing truth or dare with these other inmates and i'm not entirely sure if they're real or imaginary because like i said he imagined the other woman and there's a very weird vibe about this scene so i i don't know either way it's a pretty it's a pretty good scene you know he there's one guy to cut off his arm and another guy to put a grenade in his head. I don't know how he snuck these things into. I guess he's just maybe doing it prison style. I'm not going to elaborate on that because I think after talking about Splatter Farm, I don't have to talk about any more things of an uncomfortable nature. So anyway, he's dared to cut his face off and he, you know, starts going at it. So he gets uh, some disfigurement during this, which uh, leads to him eventually making a copper mask. I guess they let inmates make copper masks in like a welding shop or whatever. This is news to me. But either way, it's a pretty creepy looking mask. And uh, once he has that mask on, I think it pretty much stays on the rest of the movie. So yeah, uh, after that, he does escape again. He kills one of the guards or whatever. I, I feel like it should be a little harder to escape a mental institution, but whatever, it's fine. After that, we get like the real killing spree. You know, Mike Straub is like crashing cars, lighting guys on fire. Pretty decent effects work with like an exploding car and a guy with like a full body 
burn stunt like he's on he is on fire like there's some legit stunt work going on here and then he takes out a machine gun and he's blasting people away there's a part where he's like driving his car and he sticks a chainsaw out the window and cuts this kid across the face gnarly dude it's just bloodshed up the ass kind of like there's a bit of a slow start get this movie going so it's like you know once he's officially out we gotta we gotta get that body count going we ain't messing around no more and while old Mike Straub is, you know, killing all these people, he's basically making his way to his wife. Because once again, that's the main goal. He's got to kill his wife. He was dared to do it. And he finally gets to his wife's house and he crashes into these garbage cans. And then this old lady comes out of her house and starts bitching him out for it. And this is actually a really hilarious scene because he's just like taking out weapon after weapon out of his car. He's not even looking at the old lady. He's just like looking at his wife's house, looks back into the car, grabs like a chainsaw and like hooks it onto this like thing on his belt. He's like, he's putting all these different weapons. Like he is gearing up. Just take, it's almost like a Looney Tune skag. Just like taking all this shit out of his car. And I think the last thing it gets is like a mace. And he does eventually use that to smack the old lady in the face. The movie has some legitimately creepy moments. It also has some good humorous moments. Out of the three movies I've talked about in this video, I would probably recommend this one the most just because it's like, it's the most fun. Uh, Wood Shipper Massacre can be a little slow at times. Splatter Farm is like, I just can't in good conscience recommend that to anyone. If you're really good at handling shock content and, you know, triggers don't get you so bad, then, you know, go for it. But yeah, overall, I really love these just like super low budget shot on video garbage. I mean, I, I keep calling it garbage, but to me, it's gold. I love this stuff. And I could probably do a whole series of videos talking about more of these films. There's a ton of them. I actually bought a book called Analog Nightmares, which is basically just a, a big, thick book that documents a bunch of these films. It covers a pretty broad spectrum of the history of these films. I'm, a, you know, an indie filmmaker myself, so I appreciate films that are made on a lower budget with lower resources. It's just kind of inspiring to think, they did all this, so can I. So check out some shot on video horror movies. Guess that's the end of this video. I'll see you in the next one. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe because I have to be a proper YouTuber and remind you to do these things. I need to get better at pretty much everything. Um, yeah.